Welcome to We Chat Divorce, hosted by Karen Chalou, Legal Liaison, and Katherine Shanahan, CDFA. Each episode, we sit down with divorce professionals and industry experts to provide insights and frank discussions about real people, real situations, and real divorce to help you achieve your best life post-divorce. This episode of We Chat Divorce is brought to you by My Divorce Solution, offering divorce financial planning so clients can secure the divorce settlement they deserve. Visit MyDivorceSolution.com to request access. Welcome to We Chat Divorce. Catherine and I welcome Dr. Romani, a leading expert on narcissism. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Our episode today is all about five ways to identify and respond to financial exploitation when divorcing a narcissist. In this episode, we're going to discuss the money habits of a narcissist so that you can be in the know and have a plan to respond. But first, let's meet Dr. Romani. Dr. Romani is a licensed clinical psychologist in Los Angeles, California, and the founder and CEO of Luna Education Training and Consulting, a company focused on educating individuals, clinicians, and businesses, institutions on the impact of narcissistic personality styles. She's the author of multiple books, including It's Not You, Identifying and Healing from Narcissistic People, Should I Stay or Should I Go, Surviving a Relationship with a Narcissist, and Don't You Know Who I Am? How to stay sane in an era of not in an era of narcissism, entitlement, and incivility. And her newest book, which I think is great, it's not you. Identifying and healing from narcissistic people. This book will be released in February 2024. Am I right on that? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank well, you. welcome well, I have, again. I have a year of reading to do here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, the book, the new book comes out in 2024. So Thanks for mentioning that. People can pre-order it now. Though. Of course, cool. of course. All right. Well, we're really looking forward to our discussion today. First and foremost, Dr. Romani, we would just love to hear a little bit about your story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, again, <clears throat> you said a lot of the things. I'm a psychologist and author and all of that, but I also understand the landscape. I have been divorced. And I think for me, divorce was a particularly challenging story. I mean, I actually remain friendly with my ex and we've, I hope, successfully co-parented our children who are now adults. But culturally, it was incredibly challenging. It's, it's, it was, it's very, um, divorce is still very stigmatized in South Asian, I'm from a South Asian Indian family. And the barriers there and, and what this really meant, it was a, um, it was just beyond a marriage not working. It was sort of a, sort of a rewriting of a paradigm after you know, how many dozens and dozens of generations of people in, in in my families. And so I think for me, it was a sort of a rude awakening. It's very difficult. It's so strange. We're in 2020, like back when I got divorced, it was 20, 20, 2008. I still think we live in a world where there's stigma. I certainly experienced that stigma. I had the challenge of, of working multiple jobs, raising kids, you know, managing co-parenting, which is harder than I think in some ways, obviously co-parenting with someone on the same roof. But once we start talking about narcissism, that's a whole mm -hmm. game. But like I said, I had blessings in the process. He and I did work collaboratively, you know, on, on parenting them. But I have worked with many, many clients in my practice who have been through this. And I, I have to say that having gone through it, in whatever form you do, you, it has, it has informed my capacity to be very empathic and present as a clinician when people are going through this and especially, especially the cultural issues around it. So it was, it was a complex and it remains a complex issue in my life. I'd say as an adult, probably the moment, most momentous event that took place. Yeah. Mm. And that's with you even getting along with your, your ex, Correct. right? So, that, so that's the thing. That's with me. We were again, collaboratively, we're on the same page, all of that. And then when you change that conversation to something about narcissism, it's a whole different game. I mean, that's, it isn't, that's no longer about divorce. It's warfare. It is, it's something nobody is prepared for. And I think, you know, it's how do you prepare anyone for that before they get married? And, and listen, I, I will say this is that I think that there is a, we don't prepare people for the rigors of marriage. We prepare every, we give, give people orientations before they go to college, before they start new jobs, but we don't sit people down. 
And we don't say, this is what community property means. This is what division of assets means. This is what happens if you, if you stop working and then you get to later life and you don't have as much social security. That's what all of this means. And I imagine while people are picking out China patterns and wedding dresses, they don't want to think about that. But it, and every one of my clients said, I was ill prepared for this. And that has got to change. And on top of that, I don't think most people are good at assessing the personality of the person they're about to sign up with. And the fact is, I think people pay more attention to the wording of their rental car contract than they do what marriage really means. I say that all the time. So I totally agree with you here. And it's a conversation I say that particularly women and Karen, I know she probably knows what I'm about to say, but you know, if we had all of our girlfriends, even in the room right now, 50 friends together, and I said, okay, let's start talking about your financial life and your relationship with your money. They all go get their glass of wine or they scatter from the room. If yep. I say, let's Absolutely. talk about sex, they all stay yep. there and you all want to yep. talk. Yep. You know, they're not embarrassed. They're so embarrassed about their yep. relationship with money. And that does have to change. And I, and I think even in addition to what you said, you know, a lot of people, even though they want to plan their wedding and they're buying their dress and they're doing all that, they see the red flags. They're just not acknowledging it. And they're so afraid to bring those tough conversations to the table about money and how it will work during their marriage. Um, and those are red flags if you can't communicate with your spouse, you know, or your spouse is controlling you in any way financially, you know, notice those red flags and come to the table and have the conversations before you start planning your wedding. Uh, expectations is a something that you need to constantly recheck during your marriage, right? And if you don't start with it before your marriage, it's really hard to start it during your marriage. Absolutely. And I think that it is a Money is power. I mean, I think that it, it really boils down to the simplest. It, it, not only money is survival, money is power. And the reason that is such an important point is at least when we talk about the subset of narcissistic relationships, they're entirely based on a bedrock of power. Those relationships are about somebody who wants power, dominance, and control. And if the other person in the marriage is not narcissistic, they are actually wanting love, connection, consistency, to grow old with someone. You're starting on entirely different agendas. And since money is power, you can all but guarantee that when somebody goes through a divorce with a narcissistic person, the money is going to be used as a weapon because it was and is the power. So that and I think that the what the stipulations of divorce are, what it really means to split up an asset is I, I actually don't think people quite understand that you almost imagine they could show someone a video before they got married. You know how we have to watch videos like mm -hmm. sometimes, like with DMV or something to, you know, you have to watch mm -hmm. the whole thing and then you can go and do whatever, take your test, make a video for goodness sake. Like say, here's a pile of money and this is how you take that pile of money and how, what it means to split up a house and how you split up the equity in a house. And I, again, what I've seen is that a house, a house is equity and a house is also a home in memories. But when it comes down to the battle of a narcissistic divorce, it's, it, you know, it's, it's the painful excision of this happening. And then you throw in there things like custody and all of that, which is also linked to money. But I fully agree with you. And that that's a larger conversation on women and money and people understanding money. And it is a, um, and on the idea of handing over control of money, it is a that that financial literacy piece is huge. And why we're not teaching it in schools, it could be a substitute for so many courses that people are not going to ever use, like physics or something like that. I mean, short of a person who's going to be a physicist, I don't know that anyone needs to know that. So substitute that for financial literacy and those sorts of and nothing against a physicist. I mean, I right, right, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> but you know, I, what I'm saying. yeah. It is we're not we're not starting this early. And I think that 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 challenge right there of the not knowing is where people, you know, if if let, let me put it this way, if even before getting married or in the process of having been engaged to get married, somebody were to sit down with their partner and they were literally like a there's a, you know, they, a workshop they went through and you really had painful conversations about what it would mean if some, one person was working and one person was not, what it would mean if one person put more of the down payment than the other, but both names are on the deed. And then really sit down and say, if this didn't work out, then, 
and and see and see almost do it as a role play you would get you would detect a lot of financial red flags in another person on the basis of their their responses to that question that said even at at that stage when people are in the midst of an engagement and everyone's sort of ooing and aahing over them and they're planning a wedding nobody nobody is able to envision the scenario that this may not work out well you know we've been getting a lot of prenup work and, yeah. you know, at my divorce solution, it's not always a divorce is not always your solution. But the reason why people are coming to us and they're pretty much high net worth uh, individuals who have been coming um, is because they don't want to go to two attorneys who are going to tell them the way things will happen. Yeah. Right. And keep it so linear. They come to us and they actually have those hard, hard conversations. Mm. You know, what is your intent if you did get divorced and this oh. would be, what would you want to happen with this account? Or what would you want to happen with your incomes? If you're, what if you, one of you stops working when you have kids, but, and then we just lay it out in their portrait and then the attorneys could put the legal language in to protect it. But it is providing that space to have this very difficult yes. conversation. Yes. And it's, it's interesting what unravels and I love it when what unravels is that they really are in love with each other. And now they're really on the same page financially. And this prenup is really just to protect them and what they really, how they see it, not what two attorneys are telling you. Now sure. the attorneys are useful to protect the language of what your intent is. And that's what's needed. And, and we do the same thing with divorce. You know, it's still, it's still a hard conversation, but to provide that space where people are heard because narcissism and i know you'll back this up and talk about it it's not just in the form of okay we have this bank account and i'm controlling it it is you're not allowed to work you're not allowed to have right. access Correct. to this right. you can only spend right it goes so much deeper that people have to understand what those expectations are mm -hmm. you know especially with the two two couple the two parties working you're like what's going to happen if one of you chooses not to work to raise right. your children you know right. Mm -hmm. You know, are you going to have that conversation? No, people just kind of dredge along and then they come to us when they're married 20 years because they've never had, they just keep getting disconnected and financially being controlled and it's hard right. to come back in. Yep. Yeah. You're right. So I think what we're all saying today is when one person sees money as power, it's, a, it's important for the counterpart to at least be empowered with their relationship to money right. so that they can be at the table making good decisions for themselves and within that relationship. So let's, let's get into these five money habits. And I appreciate that Dr. Romani, you say that a lot of times people don't realize that they're in a relationship with a narcissist. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those people in several relationships just mm -hmm. because when your culture is that way, you don't realize that there's a different way. And so I really appreciate that you address this. And the first one you say is they are secretive about their finances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So remember going back to that. Yeah. Narciss narcissistic people are about power, dominance, and control. That's Those are the prevailing dynamics they're going to bring into any relationship, including an intimate relationship. So they are not, in a way, secrecy is also power, right? Not not letting the other person know what they have stockpiled. You know, and you see that there's a tremendous asymmetry in narcissistic relationships, and that asymmetry is magnified when it comes to money. For for many narcissistic folks, knowing how much money that they've put away, it's almost as though they get a lot of solace from that. And so they're not going to let on what's there. And the way that secrecy can show up is lots of ways. They will do things that are quite manipulative, like, hey, listen, I, I, I'm I, a business person or I studied business or I know a lot about economics. I'll take care of all this. Like, you're so busy. And they might even play to the, the and, and almost play to this sort of pseudo empathy of like, you're so busy with the kids. You're so busy with the house. You're doing such an amazing job. Let me be on the finances so you don't have to deal with it. All you need to do is sign the tax form, you know, once a year and that's it. Right. And a lot of people and I, again, especially in heterosexual marriages, a lot of people, a lot of women have been socialized, despite how smart they are to still not know. Oh, I don't know as much about money. Well, they do run a business, so maybe they do know more about money. They often don't. But so in that way, the narcissistic person will get in there. They will hijack the finances under the pretense that I'm doing you a favor. And then the person will 
find themselves in a position, the other person in these divorces will find themselves like, I didn't know any of this. I didn't know. And they, the narcissistic person may also be up to no good, especially in more severe malignant narcissism. They may be using the money for whatever their own purposes are, uh, shady investments, substance use habit, gambling habit, uh, paying for a, a, a another like a, a, a infidelity or something like that. They may be wanting to use this money as sort of as a personal slush fund. They don't want the other person to know. And so they'll also want the secrecy around that. They'll have their own credit cards, all of these other things. And so the secrecy allows them to sort of basically in an entitled way, do whatever the heck they want. And then also when, if this thing falls apart, they're the only ones who know fully where all the money is kept. And then you start getting into really expensive issues for people who are more well-resourced forensic accounting and all of that to sort of chase all this money down. But the secrecy is something that often happens in a way that people will say, now I feel played, but at the time I felt taken care of because they said, I've got this all covered. And they might even lie. Like our money is growing. I have it invested so well. In a few more years, we'll be able to afford this or that. That's called future faking. And a person's like, oh, this is amazing. They're so good with money. And it's easy to fake a balance sheet. Mm. Well, I'm glad you said that because you can't even tell you how many people come in and they say, oh, I have a a word doc, an Excel sheet actually sure. that my spouse put together for us. And he's always knows, and he knows it. And, right. you know, we, we have about a 90% rate of spouses coming through the process as participants. So we get on the call with them and we're always, uh, we understand the personality trait. So we're always like, okay, can I just have the documentation to support that? Mm -hmm. Which is a whole nother, uh, dynamic or shift yeah. in their attitude. Right. Um, but in getting that shift from the other side, we see the person who did not have that information just sit a little bit differently, you know, feel a little bit more confident because they're realizing that they do, they do um, deserve to have the documentation to support a number. Just yeah. realizing that you deserve that starts making you feel a little bit better. So it's really hard. How do you get them to that first step to realize that they deserve this information? I'm going to push back on that a little bit, and I'll tell you why. Everybody deserves that information. Mm -hmm. But that concept of deserving went out the window a long time ago when a person's in a narcissistic relationship. They're caught up in the sometimes at times traumatizing warfare of having their identity fully hijacked. They're completely confused. They're anxious. They're scared to ask for something like a balance sheet. They know they're going to have to face rage and being shut down. So it's not even deserve is almost something that's so far down the track. Mm -hmm. It is terror. How I'm, I'm going to have to face up to something. Someone will say, well, they're just yelling at you. They can't hurt you. You don't know what yelling at someone means to someone. They may have grown up in a home where rage was normative. So somebody screaming at them when you were to ask, you don't even know what to ask for. And then when you finally talk to someone and say, well, you need to ask for this and all hell breaks loose and children are getting terrified and maybe even worse is happening. I don't know that it's really about creating that. I think if we say to someone, you have to believe you deserve it, that becomes a window dressing against the real dynamic of what's happening in that relationship, which is, in, I will tell you, in, in a lot of these divorces with narcissistic folks, when people went in there and asked for financial information, that is actually when they face the worst of the abuse. So I don't know it's about deserving. I think it's about sheer fear. So they have to overcome their fear, you're saying? I don't know that they will overcome their fear because mm -hmm. the fear... Can you overcome the fear of something that is real? Do you know what I'm saying? So when the, the thing they're afraid of isn't in their mind, this person is going to lose their mind. This person is going to go through more machinations and hide money. This person is going to bleed them dry in a legal process. And on top of it, that other person is trying to raise children, stay sane, make sense because they have been psychologically manipulated for years, if not decades. So the other person's literally upside down. And now they're trying to get out of this situation. So in a way, it's more that working folks like you getting guidance on here's what needs to be happening. And it's not even so much you deserve this, but if we don't get this worked out in 20 years, you may not be able to afford rent. I mean, this is reality. And I understand with more well-heeled people, it's not about them being able to afford rent. It may be that 
you're not going to live in anything approximating the style to which you were used to. You haven't worked for 20 years. You might actually have to get a job, you know, so it's really putting it in in realistic ways of that. This isn't even about you deserving it. This is if we don't get you to step up, the consequences of this are going to be far, far worse. This was shared money. Community property means that every time you put dinner on the table for this fool, you were actually making it so he could go and make all this money that he's hiding right now. You contributed in your fashion to that money. And I think it's helping them understand things like emotional labor. And it's also about validation is that this stuff was real because many times their narcissistic partner is telling them things like, I'm the one who went out there. I'm the one who made the deals. I'm the one who made the money. I'm the one who managed the finances. But without, then you can explain to them, actually, they signed a contract with you 25 years ago. And that contract was, without spelling it out explicitly, all of the emotional labor you brought in here had a value because the state saw it fit that you would split all these assets at the end. So all that stuff to you, you did contributed to what's in that account. And it's sometimes painting it out that way. I actually think getting people to that point that they deserve it, that's years and years of therapy. And it's often years and years after the divorce is over. Yeah, I guess it's just that I feel like um, they need the courage, right, to get over yep. the next step. And it, what I like about our process is that when we're given, you know, we're knowledge based, our financial specialists do not invest money for our clients, everything is providing the knowledge of their lifestyle analysis, their budget and what they have and what's missing, right? But I feel like when they don't come through our process, they go hire an attorney who then bu bullies them around too, because they just don't know how to regulate all of that. Um, yep. And if you don't have any financial knowledge, you're 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 always fear you're fear driven, right? So right. I, so if it's not deserve, it is like I guess the conf. I don't know what the word would be. Like I get what you're saying. I totally follow that. But I just want people to understand that they should get this financial knowledge before they go into a relationship with another professional who is now steering I'm, their, you know, steering their direction again. And I think that that is it's getting the knowledge. So I think it is it's almost a sense of because I, the reason that language matters is if we use the language of deserve with most survivors of narcissistic relationships, it's not even in their vocabulary anymore. Long ago, that got broken out of them, that they don't deserve anything. And if they think they deserve something that they're demanding or needy, again, that the whole idea is that needs and wants, desires are all shamed in a narcissistic relationship. But if it could be framed as almost like a, these are just the bare minimum of facts that one would need to know it would be like taking a class on how to buy a house or taking a class on whatever. And that, and, and this is where it gets so challenging from your position is that sometimes that the concept of worthiness and deserving is almost up here. And a person who's in a narcissistic relationship is still stuck down here. And that one day you hope they'll see they deserve it. Another sort of position that I think that can help when I've talked with survivors is justice, right? So justice isn't about necessarily deserving. It's justice. It's almost like saying, hey, your neighbor's house got burglarized and you got burglarized. Do you both or do you both do you feel like you both are, are, are you both deserve using your word both deserve law enforcement getting involved? They're like, yeah, there we both got burglarized. And so then you can use that analogy to hop in there and say, okay, this is the same. It's a just, it's an injustice. There was a rule and now they're trying to break that rule because it doesn't work for them anymore. And mm -hmm. that's not how it works. And so it's almost hitting it because it's hard. These relationships, unlike many others, really do a number on people if they really have gone through the worst of the narcissistic abuse. So it's really also how severe. There I love I really like learning that analogy or that um the psychology behind that because mm -hmm. I never really looked at that deserve word as something that you, how you're pointing it out. I always just look at it as a symmetry of information and that right. everybody has a right to that information. So I never really took it to that, you know, deserving is so far fetched for so many people mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. they can't even ascertain doing that because we do have a lot of people that say they're going to go ask their spouse for permission to hire us. And I guess it just goes in line with what you're saying. They're thinking it's so far fetched to ask for that. And so now if we back it down, yeah. um, it will really help us deliver that message because that's right. That's right. Yeah. Everybody needs to have financial clarity. Right. Everyone. So yeah. Everyone. So yeah. Thank you for taking me down that, um, that conversation.
it really is impactful. That's great. All right, let's move on to number two so we can get through the five. (laughs) I know, we'll be here all day. (laughs) Okay, number two, they are only generous with money in public. Yeah, so I'm sure you've heard this in a, in a different way, again, because you're helping them understand finances, but it can confuse a person in one of these relationships. And it can also mess with the audience, as it were. So a narcissistic pe- person might take out the whole family, in-laws, everyone for dinner, the check's over $1,000, they throw down the credit card with flourish, everybody, don't worry about it, I got this, eat, drink, you know, the whole grandiose posturing thing, right? For the spouse who's going through this and often dealing with a lot of already sort of the micro financial abuses, especially if the divorce hasn't begun, there can be a real disconnect that's created because everyone thinks, gosh, you're so lucky. He's so generous. We can't even afford to go out to dinner. And, oh my gosh, your lifestyle. And so, and you'll also see a sumptuous lifestyle. They may entertain lavishly. They may pay for vacations. So the spending becomes public. And what it does is it almost fosters this network of enablers and emboldeners who will often think like you're so, we'll often think if someone's generous, they're great. I mean, if someone's generous, they picked up the check. I need to spend a little more time with them to find out if they're actually a decent human being. But somehow we think people picking up the check makes them a saint. And it's really, it's not that. But for the person in the relationship, which is already probably crumbling, it confuses them. And in fact, many times the non-narcissistic spouse or the emotionally abused spouse will say, maybe this is a me thing. Like maybe that's why my book's called It's Not You. People are like, maybe this is me because yeah, they did pick up a thousand dollar check and I'm maybe maybe this is all relationships and no one else's spouse is doing this. And I'm the bad one for being so persnickety. Right. So it creates this and it can, in some case, create a false security. You're like, well, they were generous. They might have bought sumptuous gifts and all kinds of stuff and things that you'd have to wear in public. Yeah, look at that bracelet. You know, I got that for her for Christmas. And so there'll be a lot of that. And then the person will say, oh, my gosh, they're going after me for something my mother gave me 15 years ago. And and it's a complete disconnect. So in a way, if they don't meet with folks like you or even before they meet with folks like you, they're confused as hell because they're not prepared for this. But that that sort of public generosity speaks to the two masks of the narcissistic person, the really charming, charismatic one to get validation and supply and the rather cruel, harsh, invalidating one that happens behind closed doors which is how they regulate and they take it out on the person or the people who they believe can't or won't leave them. And that goes so much into agreements where they, they'll they say, oh, my spouse said, if I agree to this, he'll take care of this forever, or he'll always do this for me because he wants to make sure I'm okay. you know. Mm-hmm. And so they'll compromise or they do a premature negotiation because somebody's promising them something else in return. And that 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 sort of that phenomenon you're talking about, Catherine, is a um, is called future faking. So you do this, and I promise this will be taken care of down the line. Well, down the line shows up, and they don't do it. And if nothing is in writing and nothing's enforceable, they're like, "Oh, your word against mine." Mm-hmm. And people will. It is utter devastation for the person because they really don't have a leg to stand on at that point. And so that future faking is a very common manipulative dynamic in narcissistic relationships. That's a whole other podcast we have to have you back on. That's so true. I was speaking with someone this week and she wanted, you know, she said he sent me a proposal and I have to respond in 24 hours or he's going to take it off the table. And he said, I can have everything if he doesn't have to support me for, I think that it was like a permanent. So it would be for like 20, 25 years. And I just want to know if this is a good deal. Well, you can't know that unless, you know, you assess it and you, apply the financial impact. And unless you take the time to do that, you're not going to know, no one can tell you. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they're put under this deadline. That's right. There's always a deadline. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's coercive. And that kind of coercion is not uncommon, especially in more severe narcissistically abusive divorces. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that brings me back. I'm glad you brought that up, Karen, because that brings me back and you'll probably talk a little bit about this to when when somebody just jumps from their relationship to an attorney who they think is a pit bull or whatever somebody tells them to hire and they do it without any of the financial clarity and not having gone through our process yeah. and then what happens is you know how many people tell us i didn't know i didn't have to go to mediation on that date 
-hmm. You know, they, they're going to these mediation sessions without any documentation because the other side decided not to pro uh, provide. So they're spending five grand to show up somewhere. And it, it's a pattern that continues to go. And I'm always so dumbfounded how this happens. And then when they say back to us, well, we didn't know we didn't have to go to that. No, no. I mean, people, you got to remember too, and this is what's so interesting about narcissistic people in general, but definitely in the case of, of divorces or, but I think in general, they really, really are good at harnessing the legal system in a weaponized manner. I don't know about you, but if I see a letter coming to my mailbox written on that heavy stationery that comes from a lawyer's office, my bowels turn to water. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> Even nowadays they email, but you know, like it's it's something about the way lawyers write emails. And I mean, I just see the ESQ and I'm like, oh my God, this is good. Never, ever, never has a lawyer, a letter from a lawyer ever been a good thing for any human being on the planet. Right. And so I think that they use that right there. It's almost like buying a weapon. So they'll, they'll use that. And, and people see mediation. They're worried. Like, if I don't do this, am I going to go to jail? Is this going to haunt me forever? Am I going to get in trouble? Whatever it may be, because many people don't know and may not have legal counsel or don't understand what it's about, they get terrified. And they wonder, what if I don't show up and I lose my house? What if I don't show up and I lose the kids? The stakes are so high. And that weaponization of legal processes is a very, very common play in narcissistic divorces. Keep in mind, too, that when we go away from the idealized, seduced, seductive, charming, charismatic narcissist, their other game that they play is destabilization. They're trying to constantly keep the person off balance. That's what gaslighting is about. Gaslighting is about throwing the other person off balance all the time so they give in to you. And this, this exactly what you're talking about is you have 24 hours, you have to go to the mediation and you're not prepared, but they, they're prepared because they're always prepared for battle. Now the other person's deeply destabilized and showing up to a mediation completely addled, thousands out the window, and they just don't know. And it's the not knowing that's a big, big part of this. This is why I tell folks on my end, if you're even having the first sprinklings of thinking that you are going to leave a marriage, whether you pay an hour to an attorney and say, I'm not even getting a divorce, I just want to know the steps. Because that is a time where people can already say, okay, I need to have this in order. I need to have this in order. And it might, you may, they may not leave for three years, but I said, the last thing you want to do, you never, ever, ever want to tell a narcissistic person that you're pursuing a divorce with them without having all your ducks in line. Because if you don't, they're going to get their ducks in line overnight. It does matter how you start. And that's what, again, because we're not attorneys, so we don't file, we prepare right. somebody, we get somebody prepared. We've had someone, I think the longest was five years it took her. Yeah. Um, believe right. Because our service doesn't expire. But it's so important that they take that step because it really will change the course of your process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because like I said, I'm always struck by how quickly the narcissistic person in a divorce is able to get everything you know, teed up. And, and I think it's mostly because they've often been in charge of the finances. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, their whole role is to keep the other person uninformed because the legal yeah. system, the divorce industry is all about settling at like whatever cost it is. And so if you're not a client who's bringing to the table to your attorney, I'm prepared and I want these things because I know why I want these things. Mm -hmm. Your attorney's just going to like flow with you. That's their job to, you know, today you want the house and tomorrow you want alimony and the next day, well, maybe you want 401k. Mm -hmm. Like if you're constantly changing your mind, your attorney's role is to respond to whatever you want today. Correct. Right. They at there, they represent you and what you want. And when you go to them, they're going to ask you, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what you want based on the financial impact, you're on a hamster wheel until you yeah. run out of money. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. you're forced to settle for something that's probably a quarter of what you would have otherwise been entitled to. So that's, that's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. That's what you're doing is so, so important. Yeah. What does so it let's do go. to a victim? I'm sorry, Karen. Oh, no, what does ahead. it do to, with that, with that analogy, what is your take or your insight on someone? I don't want to use the word victim, but by, by someone who um, 
go, you know, their attorneys are promising them all the same promises. Yes, that's what you want today. I'm going to get you that. Okay, tomorrow you want this. I'm going to get you that. Or, okay, we're going to use this data division. Okay, now three months goes by. We're using this data division. And you, they just keep going. We see people spend 50 grand and upwards to come back to where we originally wanted them to have the clarity, right? What is that? What, what are they thinking um, in your viewpoint as they're letting their, do they ever feel like they can take control or is it because they don't have that financial knowledge that they'll never take control? I'll tell you what, the reason I think a lot of folks don't feel that they can take control isn't, I mean, it's it's terrible when there's an attorney who's sort of taking them down the garden path. The good, the good attorneys out there who understand narcissism, understand how this game is played and work with their clients to not waste their money and are very realistic with them. Some attorneys don't get it or are shady and will keep taking people down that garden path and keep taking their money. But the fact of the matter is, is that I think that what's happening is that the person who is going through the divorce, if it keeps happening like that, keeps saying three months, another date of division, all of those things are happening. It's because the narcissistic person is is probably engaging in heaven knows what tactics on their side, right? So the person is actually much, much more destabilized by what the partner is or the ex-partner is doing to them. And so they might even view the attorney who keeps shape-shifting for them as an ally, as an asset, because they're doing what they're asking them to do. And so does that make sense? Because mm-hmm. the attorney isn't pushing back and the attorney may not even be clearly manipulating them. They're just not giving them good guidance, right? Or they're not understanding the narcissism of the other of the other petitioner in the divorce. But they are, um, but the, so the, I think that in many cases, the survivors are, I think over time, they're going to get frustrated because they're saying, I have just given you $50,000 and all I've done is wasted a year, but it might take almost a year and a lot of legal bills for a person to open their eyes and say, what are you doing? But I think that more of the destabilization is happening that if all that time is dragging out, it's because they're, they're being more affected by the, the, by the partner. It's a good point. Great perspective. All right, let's move on to number three. They skimp on the essentials. Yes. So, you know, and this, that, that is a, remember the whole idea of the narcissistic person wanting to spend grandiosely, right? It it might be again, paying for the dinner, paying for the vacation, entertaining sumptuously. It may be that the elaborate gift and all of that. But then when it's the thing you actually need, like you're saying, Hey, let's just keep an extra bag of sugar for the holidays in the house, because we're going to be baking a little, why do we need two bags of sugar? Or could we get like the kids the slightly better sneakers? Because last year they were scrambling in the beginning. Well, can't we just, you know, like, why do we need that? So it's these very basic, basic things like some basic groceries or basic things that the children may need or that kind of thing that isn't so glam, isn't getting so much validation. And they may even shame the partner and say, oh, look at you just spending all our money. Like, what do you think this is? Like you're buying all these extra groceries we don't need. You're so wasteful, you know, and it's, you're, you're trying to spend all my money. And again, that confusion of these relationships. So they will, and, and that's even during the marriage, post divorce, you will fight them for a pair of shoelaces. I mean, so, and what will happen is if it is an asymmetric, inequitable divorce for whatever reason, a bad settlement, a a tricky prenup, whatever reason it is, and the other person is having to, and and because the other person is probably taking on the lion's share of the good parenting, it might be like, we need a, we need like another t-shirt for gym class. And they'll say, yep, nope, sorry, not getting that. And so you're fighting, you're, you're, you're spending a thousand dollars to get a $15 t-shirt bought because you're hauling people back into court. That's what I also mean about essentials is that even after the divorce, but even during the marriage, there's a, there can be an odd miserliness about narcissistic mm-hmm. folks who will spend $20,000 on some weird signed basketball that they wanted as a collectible. But like, again, we'll argue with you about the extra bag of sugar you want to have because you want to make cookies for the holidays. So true. Uh, So true. (laughs) I'm sure so many people can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Number four, they're hypocritical. Yeah. So hypocrisy is very built into the narcissistic personality style. And it's really a reflection of the entitlement. One set of rules for me, one set of rules for you. And so because of that entitlement, because of, which is pretty much the sole driver of hypocrisy, they will make assumptions about money 
that will feel very hypocritical. And so, and it, it'll, it'll look like a shape shifting, you know, whatever that hypocrisy about money is, is I, you know, I am not going to spend, I'll give you an example. It's, it's, it's sort of based on something I've once in, encountered in a client. They kept fighting and fighting and fighting the client on tuition for children, right? The, where they lived, the schools weren't great. So they wanted the the, the parent, other parent wanted to send them to a Catholic school or something else would be like five, $8,000 a year. And the judge wouldn't mandate that. Like you have public schools, you can send them. Otherwise, the parent who wants them to go to private school, you can pay for it yourself. That's something that comes up a lot. And she kept fighting and fighting him on it. And it wasn't working. She finally had, she took some loan or borrowed it from family. But at the same time, he was spending about $10,000 on some like Bora Bora, like Pacific Island vacation with his new girlfriend. That's the hypocrisy, right? Is that I, you know, I'm going to leave you all to suffer. I can, it's, I, I can spend money on what I think is important. This isn't important, but it's, it's really two sets of standards. You can live in that way. My kids can live in that way. But another thing that could happen is when the kids are with the narcissistic parent, they will be much better resourced. The experiences are better but we'll hold back on even giving that other parent money for whatever they might need, sports equipment, anything like that. So that's what I'm saying is that it's very much two sets of standards. And, but that two-facedness that it's really a byproduct of the entitlement. Yeah. Oh my goodness. The, what you just said is something we encounter. And I think Catherine had talked about it earlier in the conversation when people come to us and want to purchase our services for financial knowledge you know, they will spend the money and the very first thing, because their spouse has trackers on all the credit cards and, you know, notifications in that way. And so the spouse will say, well, you didn't ask me before doing this, but conversely, they have no idea about anything, any other way that money is being spent. They know he just came or she just came home with a new vehicle Mm -hmm. and they know that they just you know, purchase tickets to a baseball game or whatever the, it may be, but they're under fire for spending money that wasn't approved. hundred percent. And I think that's what you're saying. That's exactly what it is, is that they will, you know, they will exactly that it's the, the credit card with the tracker. People don't understand that that's actually part of what we could, we call coercive control, right? That it, cause we, we, you know, listen, our image of coercive control is somebody who has no power. They're isolated. They can't get out of the house. They're alone. Coercive can control can happen in a big fancy mansion where somebody's like, spend anything you want. And then they will critique that spending every single day. But like you said, we'll never be accountable for their, for their spending. I have had many, many a client pay for therapy in cash because there's, I don't even want this to be known any to the, to my spouse in any way. And, and that's the reason, you know, so it's a, um, in, in there's all kinds of ways people have to figure out the workarounds and it feels absolutely awful. But, but again, it's that it's the confusion of this is the world sees the person with this limitless credit card shopping and this, oh, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. And it's a prison right? It's a prison and they will not. Um, and I think that creates a tension within the survivor who says, will think I would almost ha- rather have one one hundredth of this, but at least have independence and autonomy. And I think that that's what gets lost both personally and financially in a narcissistic marriage. So agreed. All right. Number five, they're punitive with money. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that I think we've been kind of circling around that drain this whole time that money is used as a way to, I mean, again, it's a tool of power. It's a tool of them getting to control other people, right? You can really keep people in your sway if you have money, right? And that for narcissistic folks with money, they're able to keep a coterie of admirers around them at all time. But in the same breath, they can withhold that money. They can say, well, I guess I'm not going to pay again. The kids tuition is a popular one. I guess I'm not going to pay that. I remember that so clearly playing out in one narcissistic divorce I saw. And, you know, he had gone it, serial infidelity. He decides he it's California, no fault state. And 
he then decides to take up. Obviously, she's much younger with him. It was all the tropes you could imagine. And they their sons were in private school and he refused, refused to pay because I think she was she was asking for something in the in the divorce settlement that he did not want to give. And she and he was supported by the judge. And so she again, she had to come up with the money. And so it's things like not paying for things that matter. It's holding off till the 11th hour before giving a person money where they might miss a deadline. So the other person is living in absolute tension about whether this will come and might be having to sort of scrape up other sources of money, not paying rent or a housing cost or a mortgage bill or property tax bill until the very end. And a person wondering, oh God, what's going to happen? So if they control that, they really can be very, very, very cruel rule with that money. And so you will see that play out not only after the divorce or during the divorce, but even during the marriage. So kind of showing a person who's boss. Yeah. Aye, how, do you, aye, aye. how do you think they get the courage to actually leave their marriages? It's a great question. It is a a process of fits and starts. I mean, I think for many people, it's almost like what we see in the domestic violence literature in the sense that people what on average, what do they say? People leave seven times before they stay out forever if they're not killed once in that period of leaving seven mm. times, right? And I think that a similar kind of process unfolds with folks who are going through narcissistic divorces because there's so much second guessing, because it's so confusing, because in narcissistic relationships, there are often some really good days. People will say, I was on the verge of leaving and then we spent the summer at this lake cabin and it was like everything changed. And then we got back and everything was terrible. And I just assumed it was the rigors of life six months into that gaslighting. But now they've stayed in this marriage for another nine months. Right. So I think you it's amazing what a weekend in Hawaii can buy in mm -hmm. a marriage in terms of goodwill and staying for another year. So I think that people because of that shape shifting, the good and the bad dynamics like trauma bonding, the confusion, the self-blame, the self-doubt, the enablers and the emboldeners who might actually think this is a good marriage, cultural factors, you put all that together, then people actually have a very difficult time to leave, but a lot do leave. I think there's one thing that happens and why people leave is they sort of hit what we could call a proverbial rock bottom. Something almost unseeable, like that you can't unsee it again happens. Sometimes it's infidelity. It's a popular one. Um, so infidelity may happen. Um, it can be that something happens with the children, that something is said to children or children are psychologically abused in a way that they can't tolerate anymore. Um, those tend to be, it tends to, I hate to say it, but it's often the big ticket stuff that pushes the accelerator for people to leave. In a subset of cases, obviously the narcissistic person leaves, right? They found, they found their new source of supply. They've been cheating. They decide they're going to take up with that new person. And I know while that's devastating to survivors, I often want to tell them this is the best thing that could have ever happened. Yes. Because yes. now you've gotten rid of them. I know, I know broken heart. And what did they have that I don't have? Nothing. They just had new supply. But the now they're distracted with their shiny new thing and they're sometimes willing to move quickly and you're going to get a much better exit out of this in many ways than if you're the one who leaves. If you're the one who leaves, you can set a clock. You're going to go through post-separation abuse and it's going to be a nightmare because narcissistic folks are very rejection sensitive. So it is, I think it's a combination of things. It's often an external, like a, what I've had clients say to me, listen, if he cheats on me, I have a legitimate reason to leave. There sometimes might be physical violence or somebody throwing something across a room, even if they don't physically hit them, they might break something or do something really frightening or scare everyone. There could be that kind of thing. But are there people that over time say, I can't do this anymore. I am being controlled. I'm being gaslighted. Yes, absolutely. I do see that happen. More often, I see that that external event happens that you just can't unsee it. And people are like, this is this is really sort of unsustainable. Another reason people will leave is their kids all hit 18. You know, my favorite is the divorce filing that happens the day after the youngest child's 18th birthday, right? So they wait till everyone's 18. So they get that out of the way. And so then the filing no longer involves all the, the vagaries of family court. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we pretty much see all the same thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. What yes. a great conversation. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it is. Oh. And I love what you're doing because Thank I you. do think that you're 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 putting structure and people who are so are going through something that is so shattering, you're putting structure on part of it. And structure is so important when people are 
so panicked and being so confused and so manipulated and so abused. So I think it's really, really great. And I, I just, you know, wish more people had access to this kind of information. But I also think I, I also wish people were learning this at a younger age. And I think we still have too much of a existing societal narrative about someone's going to come along and save the day and financially take care, take care of everything. And I mean, it's still a very circa 1951 throwback mentality. Mm -hmm. And we, and it's, it's a real shame because it, it takes a lot of people and it silences them and it, um, it leaves them stuck. And, and again, I know we're talking about it in a gendered way and it often affects women disproportionately, but there are men in this situation too, oh, yeah. who have a much more resourced spouse and they are going through a nightmare of wanting to, you know, have joint custody and might even face different kinds of biases in the system. So it's really narcissistic relationships by definition are asymmetric. And I think finances are one of the primary ways that that shows up. Well, we need to continue the conversation, right? To. I think we'll <laughs> hop onto your audience, you hop onto ours. And Absolutely. I think by, by, by joining and having these tough conversations and laying it out there and um, it just benefits everyone listening and hopefully it gives them uh, the, the, the confidence to move forward, to get the structure that they need. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and what, a, what, a, what a way to take down a part of an industry, the divorce industry, is if oh, we can yeah. continue this conversation. Um, we're all for it. That's what we're here for. And we're so happy to have met you to have this conversation. Yeah, me too. I'm so glad we did. I'm so glad for what you're doing because, yes, the divorce industrial complex is a, yeah, that's its own. I mean, I don't think people quite understand it because many people don't ever touch it. But when you do, you're like, what is this? And I can say from my seat, from colleagues who really intersect with that system, people I know who are advocates in the family court system, this is a disaster. And now you even look at the changes they're even trying to make legislatively around it's it's. I'm thinking, what world are we in? And that's why I tell people, you've got to be very careful before you get married. We have romanticized something that is a, a, a huge legal commitment. It'd be like romanticizing, I don't know, signing your loan documents. You know, it's, it's sort of, that's not, we don't have cake and champagne that day. We go and quickly and sign the thing and make sure the wire gets through. It's a legal, you know, it's a legal thing. And we, again, by making it into a party, it's, it's a real slippery slope. I want to often tell people, have a party, go celebrate your love, but don't sign the damn dotted line. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Unknowingly. Unknowingly. And then when you do it knowingly, me, in fact, they should, they should talk with people like you before they ever get married. That's totally. what I would like to see. That's what I, I would agree. Like to see. I my, totally agree. It could be my marriage solution as well as my divorce. <laughs> I, love I really think we could talk both both <laughs> yes, um, tracks of yeah. those. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, absolutely. That would actually be even better yeah. because I think a lot of people would see how mean spirited their their narcissistic partner is about money. And if they could start seeing some of that early on and then sit with people like you saying, This is concerning me. Like this person is not understanding what what joint assets are and all of that, be prepared that if this doesn't work out, you're in for the fight of your life. Mm -hmm. So oh. true. Okay. We're doing that. That's another podcast. I love it. <sighs> Sounds great. I would love awesome. that. Thank you so much for your time and for, and for talking about my new book, because I think it's really important for people who want to heal from these relationships. So I appreciate yes. sharing that. Thank you. So Dr. Romani, can you just spend a couple minutes um, telling people how they can find out more about you? I know we know the books, but if you can just briefly go over that, I think that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you could find me at my, at my website. If you go to drromany.com, everything is there that you need information on all of it. We have a YouTube channel. We post new content every day. So there are over a thousand videos and it's all organized and catalogs. So if you go to the channel, you'll find some of that. Certainly we're on all social media at Dr. Romany. We have a healing program for people who are healing from narcissistic relationships that meets monthly. You can find that info on my website. And again, it's not, you almost takes all of it and condenses it into a single book. And that is you can pre-order it now and pre-orders matter to us as authors. So people can do that. You'll be the first one to get it. So, and it's, it's really there that it, this is as much as this is a depressing conversation, it's not a hopeless one. And for people to know that not only can they heal, they really will excavate that deep, deep resilience they had for even being able to weather these relationships in the first place. So yeah. And then we have a podcast, all of that, but you can go to my website, it's all there in one place. Excellent. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Awesome. And thank you again for a fantastic conversation. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank yes, you. So thank you. Thanks for joining us on another episode of We Chat Divorce. 
We hope this episode was informative and supportive on your divorce journey. If you're looking for more support for navigating divorce with confidence and clarity, head over to mydivorcesolution.com for more podcast episodes, divorce events, and resources for your divorce. We'll see you back here for our next episode.